Hi, good afternoon, chairs and members of the committee. My name is Lisa McCabe, and I'm with CTIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry. Who is CTIA, and why do they matter? Well, about five years ago, I actually went to CTIA. It's a trade show for people in the wireless industry, and they were pushing really hard to get people to show up who were involved in independent repair, whether individuals or small companies. And many of the booths at CTIA were companies that were specifically with their marketing products and services targeting independent repair. And those booths are paying $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 to be there. It costs a pretty penny to have a nice booth at CTIA. So I find it very interesting when they show up in opposition to something that most of the independent repair community is standing solid behind and supporting while simultaneously profiting off of us showing up at their conventions. And I think it's really important for people who are either considering having a booth at CTIA, giving money to CTIA, or showing up at CTIA to understand exactly where their leadership Leadership falls on this key issue. Our members include wireless service providers, infrastructure providers, suppliers, and uh, manufacturers. And we are here in opposition um, to this bill. As was mentioned, um, there is a process by which consumers have a number of ways in which they can get their um, products today repaired. And many of those options, just like myself, are relying on schematics that fell off the back of a truck and parts that the OEMs are doing their absolute best to ensure are not available to us at any and all costs. Not to mention the types of exclusivity agreements Apple will make with companies like Intersil, whereby if I want to replace the charging chip that commonly dies on a $3,000 machine that costs about $5, I'm not able to purchase it from them because they'll tell Intersil, uh-uh-uh, don't you sell it to anybody who wants to fix our product. So the way that I will have to fix that product is I'll have to find some donor board in a dumpster somewhere that has that chip, rip it off of it and put it on there, or buy a wireless charger or something like that that has that chip and rip it off, reball it, put it on there. The problem I have here is that they're using the fact that resourceful individuals like myself or Jessa or Chris Long or Tim Herman have been able to overcome adversity as evidence for the fact that that adversity is just fine and to still exist. The fact that we are able to do our job with the manufacturer's boot on our neck does not mean that there's no problem with the manufacturer having a boot on our neck. I do not believe that someone should be allowed to use the fact that it is difficult to do work in this industry as an excuse for their own failure. At the same time, it does not mean that that adversity should exist unchallenged when there is no good reason for it. Having legislation that mandates the um, giving away number of different types of information that could be proprietary, could, um, could actually even have some legal ramifications. Let's see how many of those legal ramifications she lists, given that her title is Director of State Legislative Affairs for a very well-funded organization. And also could be dangerous because of the security of devices, if all of a how-to book is given out there on how to work on every bit of electronics. Can someone explain to me how, knowing the impedance of a backlight coil, the resistance value of a pull-up resistor, or the capacitance of a capacitor to ground on VCC main makes a device more or less secure? If they had any idea what they were talking about, they would know and understand that a schematic that shows you what the values of the components in the device are cannot make it less secure because that document essentially documents everything that you have when you purchase the device to begin with. You can figure out everything that's in that schematic if somebody simply sat down for a year and measured everything and made a drawing. It's very inconvenient, but it's completely doable. But that guide on where everything is in the device, that you're holding that in your hand. And if you're able to hack a device or ruin its security based on knowing what the value is of the resistors and the capacitors inside of it, that is a shit device that should not be on the market to begin with. Because there is no way in hell that anybody with access to a schematic or a board view to an iPhone or a Samsung or an LG phone of any kind is actually going to learn anything from that that they did not have from before, that they did not have already, that would allow them to hack it and get access to your data in any way, shape, or form. And if the phone is that insecure, that it is that easy to get access to the user data, that's going to happen without a schematic, without a board view, without a diagram. Yeah. <laughs>
There, there are dangers to something that could be working on a network, and also dangers to consumers' um, privacy of their information. Let's see if she can explain what those dangers are and how making a schematic or a board view available, or the ability to purchase an ISL 9240 chip from Intracell and get rid of the exclusivity agreement, would make the device less secure. Let's see if she can explain to me how the ability to purchase a charging IC for a MacBook is going to make that device less secure or ruin user privacy. I think. Um, this bill, these both these bills have no assurance for the cus, for the consumers. It just provides saying, give out this information, and um, and and that's that. There's there's a provision in there that talks about how the um, independent repairers, if they don't like the information that they've received from. Um, a manufacturer that they have recourse, but there's no recourse in here for the consumer. When she says that consumers have no recourse, what does that mean? Does, is she talking about consumers not having a recourse if an independent repair shop screws something up, or is she talking about consumers not having a recourse to purchase parts the same way that a repair shop would in this bill? I think either of them are irrelevant, but let's just explain and take apart both of them. If she's talking about consumers not having a recourse if an independent repair shop screws something up, that is very intellectual intellectually dishonest in a very disgusting way. And it's part of the reason I think she sounds so timid and embarrassed while she's saying this, because she realizes that it's being recorded to the general public. Let me explain why that is ridiculous to even bring up in this type of hearing. Consumers do not need recourse through a right to repair bill if an independent provider screws something up, because they already have that through existing licensing law that has been around for over 50 years. So in New York City, I can't say how it is for every part of the United States, but in New York City, if I want to have a retail business open to the public that provides repair services, I need to pay and get a license. I'm on file with the city of New York. They have my fingerprints. They've gone through my background and everything is there. So there is a license that is posted prominently in the front of my business. And it says home and appliance electronic service dealer license number 1418138. And if I screw anything up of yours, you can go to that licensing agency downtown and you can say, this is what Lewis did. You can file a complaint and they will arbitrate between the company and the consumer. And if I've been found to do something that is immoral, unethical, or wrong, they will take my license away and my business will close. This has nothing to do with right to repair because consumers having a recourse if an independent provider does something shady has existed for decades before small independent device repair even existed in New York City. And many cities, states, municipalities around the country are the same way whereby if you want to do business, in a certain area, you need to get a license from the local government. And if you don't get that license and you try to do business anyway, they will make life very difficult for you and shut down your business. Now, if she's talking about a recourse to get parts, like, well, this doesn't mention the consumer's right to get parts from the manufacturer. That is something that is then solved, called something through a reseller. So if the average person wants to fix their own car in their garage, they don't go straight to Chevy or Mazda. They may go to an auto parts reseller that purchases those parts from the manufacturers or third parties and then resells them to the consumer. There's this thing called a reseller. So for example, I sell Intersil chips. I sell LP8550s. I sell TriStar chips on my website. Consumers don't have to go to NXP or Intersil or Texas Instruments directly to get these parts, they can purchase them from me, a reseller. And since this is a very highly competitive field with many sites selling them, that drives the price down so that none of these individuals are going to get very far if they try to rip the consumer off. This concept that there's no recourse is wrong for several reasons. The first, because she never specifies what type of recourse she means. And secondly, because every single type of recourse that could be considered in her statement is something that has already existed for a very, very long time and is outside the scope of this bill. And I think um, having um, authorized repair, people who know exactly what they're doing in order to repair an electronics, who've gone through training, who have gone through um, a, a knowledge base in order to provide things, to repair things sufficiently, safely, and securely is very important. Today, consumers can use independent repair if they choose to. They can use authorized repair. There are many opportunities already there, and this is really um, looking at an issue that is already being uh, addressed by the marketplace and by consumer demand. Thank you.
Here I'll refer to my previous statement whereby I say that just because someone is able to do their job with someone else's boot on their neck doesn't mean that the person shouldn't remove the boot from their neck. In terms of needing to be properly authorized and trained, I do agree that people who are working on these devices should have a knowledge base available to them, should know what they're talking about, and should know what they're doing. Apple, why the hell are you issuing certifications to people who don't even know whether or not the charge ports on your phone are soldered to the board or on a separate flex cable? TechWise, this is Ira. Hi, I had a question about a problem I was having with my iPhone. Uh, do you do iPhone repair? Uh, to a point. What's up with it? Yeah, so I did something really, really, really stupid. It's an iPhone 6. It's probably out of warranty. It's like two years old. I, w I couldn't get my headphone plug out of it, so I kept pulling on it, and now the plug is stuck in the jack. Is that something that yeah. you'll be able to fix? No, unfortunately not. The headphone jack is basically hard soldered directly into the logic board. Okay, so you so the hard you're saying that on the iPhone 6 the headphone jack is hard soldered it's soldered directly on the motherboard? Mhm. Mm okay, so it's not on a separate cable that then connects to the motherboard? Mm, I don't believe so, no. All right, so what would be my option, let's say if I if through you like would I be able to get the phone replaced or is there any option other than just buying another one? Uh, we would have to send it to Apple. You're looking at 4 to 5 days turnaround time and 299. Okay, so two ninety nine and uh, mm -hmm. about three to four days. I have one more question: uh, Would they preserve the data, or should I back it up before having the phone swapped? You should definitely back it up. They don't guarantee that they can do anything as far as the data goes, and in many cases, they just clear the phone even if it doesn't seem like it's necessary. So, two hundred ninety nine ninety nine dollars. You don't get to keep your data. It takes four to five days. But the best part of it all is that. The authorized place says that the headphone jack is soldered directly to the motherboard. Now, let's try unauthorized repair. Hi, Shop, I can help you. Hi, uh, do you fix iPhone 6s? Yes, we do. Okay, I did something really stupid with mine. I, uh, I was... I it tugged too hard on my headphones, and now the plug is pretty much stuck in the headphone jack. Is there any way to fix or replace that? There's a couple of ways we can do it. Either we can fish it out of there, which doesn't work every time, um, but we can definitely give that a shot first. That's the cheapest way. Okay. Worst case scenario, we could always swap out that, that port on the bottom and just give you a new port, and then that would work. So right. I always figure way that the worst case scenario that. is most likely what's going to happen. So what would that cost if you yep. had to swap out the whole port? It's a, it's a 6, right? Yeah, it's an iPhone 6, not the 6S. Okay, so it is uh, 50 bucks plus tax. Okay, so $50, and uh, one last question. Uh, and I, I, I just called uh, one of the Apple authorized places, and they told me that the headphone jack is soldered directly onto the motherboard of the phone, uh, but I always thought it was that's some little true. separate piece that plugs in. So is it actually soldered? Yeah, that's not I'm true. I'm a little nervous. It's not, on a 6, that's not true. Okay, so the Apple authorized place that told me something yeah, that was true. So, basic, so basically the way that, like, even the Genius Bar, they just, kind of spread misinformation to make you use their services. Um, That's essentially. what I was figuring, yeah. Yeah, because we've fixed, I think, five charge ports at least, you know, this week. So <laughs> it's not really, uh, it's pretty I common. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. No problem. There is a reason that first-party repair is growing and making money hand over fist from customers running to us to do their repairs rather than the manufacturer. It's because we know what we're doing and can recover data from phones that have been in the ocean, whereas the original equipment manufacturer's authorized outlets don't even know how the charge port connects to the phone in a device that was out for three years at the time of filming that video. This is sad and pathetic, and it's why we are here. It's why people are here in support of what we're doing, because the alternative sucks. And and if anything, there's one thing that I agree with her with, which is that people should have access to knowledge, they should have access to parts, they should have access to information before they start working on customer devices. And I don't understand how she can be in opposition to a bill that would make that knowledge available while simultaneously saying, we oppose this bill because there's a market that already exists. If you believe that people should have access to knowledge, experience, and information to do their job, but then you say that everybody who's currently doing their job are doing it fine, there's a 
market out there, so there's no need for this bill, I don't understand how you can hold those two thoughts at the same time. This bill would make knowledge and information available to people that are doing their job right now. You're saying that those people doing their job right now are already fulfilling the market needs, so there's no need for this bill, but you also think that people who are fulfilling this market need should have access to the very information that this bill seeks to make available. At the end of the day, this is another person who is very inconsistent in their ideas, cannot fully explain any of the buzzwords that they're using properly because they don't know how any of this works. And honestly, from the tone of her voice, I think she's ashamed to be there. I think she's embarrassed and ashamed that her name is attached to the garbage that she's reading off of that piece of paper in front of her because she knows none of it is true. She knows that her organization and herself have turned her back on the industry that she has profited from for many years, and she knows that this is the making of a turncoat. She doesn't believe much of what she's saying, and that's why she's reading it in this very kind of kicked puppy-like voice because none of it is true, and there's a camera on her. Now, just to be clear, at the end of the day, I don't have a problem with someone who disagrees with me or someone who thinks differently. Let me rephrase that. I don't have a problem with somebody who disagrees with me or somebody who has a different ideology than I do. But what I do have a problem with is when people don't argue in good faith. At the very least, let your argument be based in facts, objective reality, evidence, reason, not just something that you're reading off of a piece of paper because somebody above your pay grade said, sit in front of these senators and just read this so that you keep your job, which is what I believe is happening here. You can clearly tell from the vocal inflections that this is someone who doesn't believe believe a damn thing they're reading. They're doing it for the paycheck. They don't have any idea what they're talking about. They don't have any experience in the industry. They've never worked alongside us. They never worked trying to do what we do, and they are there for the paycheck. That is what aggravates me. It's when people are not good at their job, and I hate to say it, but I would make a much better anti-repair lobbyist than any of these folk. If you are going to attend CTIA or pay to advertise with CTIA, I would politely request that you reconsider your decision on until they stop using fallacious arguments to advocate against our industry. It's one thing to disagree with someone or have a different ideology. It's another to completely make things up to make the other side look bad in front of a senator. This is something that, in my opinion, should be considered unacceptable to anybody in our business, especially if you're actually paying to show up at these events and you're financially supporting these people. And after this dumpster fire of a hearing and hearing the fallacious arguments that were used by people who were supposed to be on our side and supporting us, I fully intend to show up to every single one of these hearings as long as they are public, regardless of the inconvenience to myself or my business, regardless of the short notice, regardless of the cost. I intend to put a face and a name to every single fallacious argument used so that you can decide which businesses to support with your money and who you want to associate with based on what people are saying, not in private, but in public. At the end of the day, this is what I heard and got out of her testimony. But you tell me if you heard something different. Hi, good afternoon, chairs and members of the committee. My name is Lisa McCabe, and I'm with CTIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry. Um, 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 proprietary um, legal ramifications, dangerous security. There, there are dangers, dangerous um, privacy. I think um, th this bill, these both these bills, and um, 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 think um, 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 uh, thank you. Uh.